Hello and welcome back, and that is right, today I want to talk about 5 Bay Nas. I've said it before and I'll say it again, 5 Bays is kind of the tipping point for a lot of users. You know, in the last few years when it comes to buying your first network attached storage device, things used to be very simple. There was a 2 Bay, a 4 Bay, an 8 Bay, and then things went mad and went rack mount. But over the years, lots and lots of Nas manufacturers have started filling in the blanks. We even saw three bay NASes arriving at one point, which is weird, but there we are, that's the world we live in. But when it comes to the five bay tier, because there has been six bays and stuff like that, five bays has always been kind of a weird one because it's kind of where home user engagement kind of ends. I know a lot of home users might argue with me and say that sure they buy six and eight and even 12 bay devices, but the fact still remains, but the bulk of home users kind of stop at four bays it provides you your raid five it's a good scale it doesn't use too much electricity but you get some good hardware out there and it's only really business users that look at the larger scale devices your five your six your eight bays and above and the reason is they are people that are producing a lot more data per day per week per month per year and with things like version storage and version backups as well as archival storage that is when these larger systems come into play now where does this kind of impact on the five bay spectrum nice and simple at the five bay level that is when the internal hardware of these systems generally has to change because up until that point the stuff that's been offered has to be a little bit more home user friendly and the five bay system we've seen every few years particularly from Synology but not just Synology we have seen that the goal posts of where that architecture should live between the home and business user have shifted constantly so in the case of two Synologies that I'm going to talk about today, they both form part of the Synology Disk Station series. They're both desktop 5 bays, and they are systems that have been released trying to find um, ever-shifting middle ground between the home and the business user. Now, one of them released two years ago was this, the DS1520+. Plus. That's right, I've got a weird graphic there on screen, I'm afraid. Um, the 1520 there um, arrived in August 2020. It's been around for shy of two years at this point, and... You know, when it was arriving just after the release of the DS920, it kind of answered a lot of the criticisms that the DS920 had. There weren't a lot of criticisms, it has to be said, but things of scalability and network connectivity were things people had concerns with on the 920, and the 1520 kind of resolved that, and it kind of addressed a lot of these, while at the same time not treading too hard on the toes of the six bay systems out there, such as the 1621+. Plus. Now, Fast forward to now, spring, summer 2022, and a new five phase coming on the block. It hasn't quite arrived yet at the time of recording, but it will be with you too. So if you are watching this in the future, hopefully all of the details I talk about today have changed, but recording now in May 2022, small differences of things like pricing may have changed, but still nonetheless, the 1522 there, this is a system that arrives at a similar price point from what I understand as when the 1520 arrived, with stark differences in its architecture there. So in today's comparison, I'm going to look at four things. I'm going to look at the internal hardware, very important. I'm going to look at the external connectivity, and I'm going to look at the storage, and I'm going to look at the software support of all four of these devices, because all Synology products are a combination of hardware and software melded into one. So without further ado, further ado let's get straight into it first we're going to talk about that internal hardware there the cpu the memory and the architecture that keeps this system afloat now the older system was built on an intel architecture there it arrived um, or still does i should say with the intel j4125 processor a quad core um, embedded graphics supported cpu there at 2.0 gigahertz per core that can be burst up to 2.7 gigahertz per core it also arrives on a four thread design there it also arrives with four gig uh, sorry eight gig i should say of DDR4 2,666 megahertz memory, non-ECC. That CPU has a 10, uh, 10 watt TDP thermal design power, and the system arrives with 120 watt PSU there. Now, the 1522 has gone a very different direction. We've already seen that architecture floating around in many other NASs of that 2020 generation. A lot of people assumed the 1522 would go a similar way, but much like I mentioned in my introduction, 
The way the five bay goalpost between home and business has shifted dramatically, and the 1522 is a marked kind of representation of what Synology think that should be. It is an AMD embedded Ryzen dual core processor there, the R1600. Now it arrives with a 2.6 gigahertz clock speed per core that can be burst up to 3.1 gigahertz. It does not feature embedded graphics, something I think a lot of people have got to be in their bonnets about because of things like transcoding and uh, using embedded graphics to improve things like surveillance and just general graphical processes where this CPU is going to have to use raw power in order to do it. And that includes 4K streaming and the like, even if you're not transcoding, and particularly if you are utilizing H.265 or HEVC, highly efficient video codec files, this system is going to require more CPU resources to be used in order to play back those files natively. Um, now, that CPU does arrive with 8 gig of DDR4 memory, however, unlike the 1520, it arrives with 8 gig of DDR4 ECC memory, error code correction or error correcting code. This is uh, a kind of memory that adds an additional cell on board that effectively, in its most base form, checks that the data going at the start and the end does not change and avoids things like bit rot and ultimately keeps your data as integral and intact as possible throughout a, uh, throughout its lifespan and all of the uh, data that passes through is checked at the start and the finish. Now, the CPU does have a higher TDP rating at 25 watts, so it, it's going to get a little hotter. It's going to use a little bit more power in, opera, in operation, and it arrives with 120 watt PSU there. Um, but that memory, not only is it ECC memory, but going to be scaled up to an impressive 32 gig of memory. And VM users, surveillance users, you're going to love that. There's a lot of memory to utilize. And if you're going to use containers in things like Docker, Again, great news there. If you're going to support larger files in Drive or with streaming, again, good news there, that extra memory. They both arrive with 8 gig, but there's no avoiding that the scalability of that memory and the fact that it's ECC makes it very, very attractive. But we can't ignore the lack of embedded graphics. We can't ignore that as far as um, uh, you know, utilizing multimedia is concerned, the 1520 is going to do a better job and a more efficient job overall. Next up, let's talk about storage because both of these devices running exactly the same version of DSM, DSM 7.1 at the time of recording, they've got similar storage support. They've got support of storage pools internally and volumes and shared folders. They can both utilize hybrid share to attach areas of C2 cloud space. They've both got things like the iSCSI uh, manager or SAN manager as it's known in DSM 7. They both support lots of different features and services. Additionally, they both arrive with support of BTRFS and of course EXT4 if you choose, but BTRFS, although the younger file system of the two is still pretty good in terms of its utilization of resources when it comes to snapshots, being a lot more efficient and therefore less impactful on your system hardware, also, shared folder duplication is a lot easier and, much like ECC, file self-healing when write operations take place to ensure that there isn't any issues during write. Now, both of these systems support SATA hard drives and both of these systems support both first and third party hard drives, although how um, hard drives are displayed in the system in DSM 7.1 within the storage manager is a fluctuating topic right now. now the four bay system, uh, sorry, the five bay fifteen twenty can be expanded up to a total fifteen bays of storage, utilizing two DX five one sevens, exactly the same as the new device. There, they both arrive with two NVMe SSD slots there for caching. Although they can't be used for raw storage, it's still a great way to improve the performance both internally and with external connectivity in some cases um, of your overall RAID storage. Talking of RAID storage, they both support Synology's hybrid RAID, the ability to mix and match drives throughout the scale of the system. Obviously on day one, you're not gonna put five different drives inside, that'd be madness. 
but you can run these systems with as little as one or two drives if you like and then a few years later when you need more data you can add more drives expand the storage pool natively and organically using shr as well as utilizing bigger hard drives as bigger drives arrive and they become more affordable or quite simply that the hard drives you were using day one a few years ago are just no longer available to buy synology hybrid raid is a very good thing and both of these systems arrive with it ultimately if you're really going to put it down to the points they're identical they support the same amount of storage and it's going to be a flat draw in terms of storage you have no advantage one versus the other between the 1520 and the 1522 next up let's talk about external connectivity because although these two are incredibly similar there's one crucial difference between them that although it isn't a day one advantage it's still going to be nice for a number of users particularly business users to have up their sleeve so both of these systems arrive with one gigabit ethernet which i know a number of you would have gone really still and that's right one gbe when the 1520 was first released although it wasn't ideal you still at least had four ports there and i think the biggest complaint people had about one gigabit ethernet in 2020 was they expected to buy this system and it would run for three, four, five years and above. And therefore, although 2.5 GPE isn't relevant now, who's to say how relevant it would be in two to three to four years? So future proofing was a concern. Therefore, when the 1522 has arrived nearly two years later and it still has one gigabit Ethernet, that's a bit of a disappointment there. They both arrive with USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports there, 5 gigabit connectivity that could be used for expanding your storage, not expanding, I should say, adding additional storage, as well as things like adding UPSs and other supported peripherals. Although the number of third party peripherals supported on USB uh, via, on DSM 7 has become less and less in the last few months. Now, there's the two expansion ports that utilize eSATA, which is always good news. And both of these systems, overall, in terms of connectivity, are near enough identical on day one. Why do I keep saying day one? Because the 1522 has the ability to add 10 gigabit Ethernet in its lifespan. You can add um, via a proprietary uh, PCIe Gen 3 times 2 slot 10 GBE. It's a micro slot there, and so long as you've got their own adapter, the E10G22T1 Mini, that's still a crap name. I, I wish it had a better name. But this allows you to add 10 GBE. Now, tangentially, I shouldn't really give it any advantage because it's not included on day one. You remove that expansion port, you remove that as any kind of option. And in terms of ports and connectivity, it's a level playing field. The only thin glimmer in terms of uh, remote connectivity that the 1522 has is the option of adding 10 GBE down the line, which is an additional purchase, much like those memory upgrades I mentioned earlier on. So, although the 1522 wins in terms of external connectivity, it's not a solid win, and it's certainly a win a number of people would question. And on to the software, and unsurprisingly, these two systems are near enough identical in terms of how they run DSMs, services, and software. With all of those applications that are included, with your purchase of the Synology NAS, from Synology Drive, to the Collaboration Suite, to Synology Virtual Machine Manager, to Surveillance Station, to Active Backup, to Hyper Backup, to Chat, to Calendar, and more, as well as access to all of the C2 synchronization services, on the C2 cloud with um, lots of password services and contact services and disaster recovery in some ways. It's a great package, either one of these two in terms of the software that you get as well as DSM being remarkably user friendly. However, ultimately when it comes down to it, although both of them support 40 cameras, um, 350 active drive users, over 3 million um, active individual files supported at any time, 128 iSCSI targets with, um, you know, well in excess of 250 LUNs, so many different, I think 2,000 users and 65,000 snapshots. It has to be said that between the two of them, when it comes to multimedia software handling, be it with third parties like Plex Media Server or utilizing Video Station and more, the 1520 is going to do a better job. However, when it comes to virtual machines, because that CPU um, has a little bit more file managed, it's got a little bit more oomph under there, and of course, the option of those memory upgrades, as well as the day one ECC, in terms of business and integral data and mission critical data, the 1522 wins on that score. So although 
in terms of software and how far you can push these softwares can be largely identical it's the type of user that's going to make a difference and that's ultimately it that when you want to compare these two devices that's what it's going to come down to the 1520 if you've come to this video there's a good chance you've done it because the 1520 is on sale it's on a not special offer you've seen it second hand you have come to this video because the 1520 is available at a lower price than 1522 or maybe you're watching this in may 2022 1522 hasn't arrived yet and you're wondering should i wait for it or should i go for the 1520 and i think ultimately it comes down to if you're a home user if you're a multimedia user if you don't plan on scaling up to 10 gbe and you just want to go with a smart switch and lagging though uh, link aggregating those four one gbe's the 1520 is still a solid nas and still one of the best nases that synology have put out in a number of years the 1522 is a very good nas and tremendously scalable more so in most ways than that of the 1520 but it has to be said home users are going to find this less useful and that line between the home and the business user suddenly moved a little bit more over here in terms of the five bay whether you like it or not so if you're a business user you might want to scope the 1522 out or at least wait until it releases but this has been my comparison of the 1520 versus the 1522 from Synology let me know what you guys think do you agree do you disagree maybe you own one or both of these devices there in the future and let me know if you agree or disagree with that if you enjoyed the video chuck me a like it helps me understand what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong and ever since YouTube took away the dislike button it's getting really hard to gauge opinion you know what I mean on top of that, if you want to learn more about this subject or if you're on the fence and you're about to make a purchase in NAS and not quite sure, click subscribe. I make a video every day and it covers everything in the world of data storage, not just NAS. And of course, if you need a little bit of help and you're looking at how much an IT expert or a data storage analyst will charge you, use the free advice section. It's linked in the description. It's manned by me and Eddie the web guy. It's our way of paying it forward from the people that have helped us. It is a free advice service. We answer as many as we can, and although that might take us an extra day or so to answer because we're only humans and we've got lives, it's so much more efficient than putting your question in the comments because it gets lost in the noise and notifications. We get more there than we can possibly answer in a day and they get lost. It's a free advice service. There's donate buttons, use them, ignore them. We don't do anything to your email, couldn't give us stuff. It's just free, impartial advice to help you. Otherwise, I will see you next time.